Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. After our broad survey of Athenian history and society in the last lectures, we return now to the Archaic period and to what will be the other superpower of the classical period, Sparta. As I said at the end of the last lecture, we can't study Greek history or Athenian imperialism in any detail without knowing about the Spartans. I call Sparta the odd man out state in Greece because it was so different from any other polis. Moreover, the other Greeks seemed to think it was different too. They both admired and detested the Spartans at the same time because of the lifestyle of the people and the, the system of brutal military training that was at the heart of their society so as to produce the best soldiers in the Greek world. In this lecture, we're going to look at various aspects of Spartan history and society, beginning with some general observations about Sparta, and then an examination of its constitution, and then we will go on from there. Sparta is located in the area of the Peloponnesus called Laconia, and its people were of the Dorian race. These Dorians had migrated into Greece and down to the Peloponnesus towards the end of the Bronze Age period. They came from the north, and indeed there is one theory that the Dorians might have brought about the collapse of the Bronze Age civilization that we talked about in the first lecture. What we do know is that the Dorians seem to have ridden roughshod over the native populations and the regions in which they settled. In the case of Sparta, for example, we find a group of people living around the city of Sparta throughout Sparta's history, a group that was called the Perioikoi. And perioikoi is simply a Greek word that means something like dwellers around, peri, around, and oikos, again, that word for home or habitation. So these were the dwellers around. Exactly who the perioikoi were is unknown, but the most plausible explanation is that they were the original inhabitants of Sparta and the surrounding areas before the Dorian invasion. And then when these Dorians arrived in the Peloponnesus, they displaced the original inhabitants from Sparta and those areas and set up shop for themselves there. The original inhabitants, though, continued living close by or dwelling around Sparta, like occupying themselves as farmers or craftsmen. And this would be a good example, then, of the Dorians displacing the native population and giving them a new name in the process, the Perioikoi. The Perioikoi, as far as Sparta were concerned, uh, was concerned, were not citizens, but they were required to fight in the Spartan army. And when that happened, they were formed into their own ethnic unit under a Spartan general. <clears throat> Sparta is a difficult place to study, not only because of the dearth of literary evidence from Sparta and the general <clears throat> character of the people, but also because of how ancient writers pictured the Spartans. Our two chief sources are the fourth century BC writer Xenophon, uh, along with Plutarch, who we have talked about before, that biographer uh, during the Roman imperial period, uh, whose uh, series of biographies of the Greeks and Romans are such a treasure trove of information about the ancient world. And we also do have additional information about Sparta from Plato and from other writers. Um, uh, and, and I will be drawing from those, uh, those sources also, but Pretty much in this lecture, I'm going to be drawn on primarily from Xenophon and Plutarch and what they have to tell us. Now, in an age where polis were suffering civil strife, stasis, um, some of them even tyranny, as we've seen in lecture two, the Spartans seemed to be above it all. Uh, to outsiders, then, they seemed to have an organized and stable society. They did not endure a tyranny, for instance. Um, and in this society, everyone was theoretically equal and adhered to the laws. There was even a technical term for this. They were the homoioi, meaning the equals. The Spartans were also seen as patriotic, and they were focused on a unique social system so as to produce physically fit citizens, even women, uh, together with the men, who together put a maximum store on bravery, on physical prowess, and Spartan men were brought up to fight and to die for the state and not to think twice about it. As a result of all of this, outsiders looking in on Sparta uh, tended to have what we might term a Spartan mirage. Um, that is, subsequent peoples and cultures have evoked Sparta uh, for their own means. That is, subsequent cultures and peoples, and that really goes for people as far uh, as close in time to the Spartans themselves as Plato, and all the way to, to the on the other end of history, 
to the founding fathers of our own American Republic, uh, as well as the totalitarian regime of Nazi Germany, all have uh, looked at Sparta to kind of see what they wanted to see, to see things in it that were sort of, um, that told more about they, they themselves uh, than about the Spartans. Well, the Spartans might have lived in an ordered society, but it was just as chaotic as anywhere else. This is part of the Spartan mirage. Uh, in refusing to develop artistically and especially economically like other poles, the Spartans created all sorts of other problems for themselves, especially when they got involved elsewhere. In other words, especially when they got involved outside of the Peloponnesus. So this Spartan mirage comes about because writers think that Sparta is so different and therefore better from other polis in the sense that it had a more ordered society and it didn't endure civil strife. And as a result, these other thinkers have distorted history. And to make matters worse for the Spartans, as we will see, the Spartans suffered the same land hunger problems as other polis had. But instead of sending out colonies or doing anything like that, such as the other Greek states were doing, the Spartans solved their land hunger problems by annexing neighboring territory and enslaving the populations. They created in the process a massive Achilles heel for themselves that no other state suffered. The Spartans would come to boast the most formidable land army in Greece until the Macedonian army under Philip II in the mid 4th century BC. Sparta, as I said, became one of the superpowers of the Greek world during the classical period. It headed a very powerful empire known as the Peloponnesian League, which ultimately defeated Athens in the Great Peloponnesian War of 431 to 404 BC. And it, it, at, at the climax of that, the end of that in 404, it would impose its own hegemony over the Greeks um, for a few decades after that. Um, yet, despite the Spartans' power and influence in the Greek world, and despite the fact that they eventually came to control two-fifths of the Peloponnesus, that is, the areas of Laconia and Messenia, uh, the city of Sparta itself was devoid of magnificent buildings, temples, and things like that. Uh, and this is in startling contrast to a place like Athens. And ancient writers commented on this as well. For instance, according to Thucydides, a historian we will be meeting later in our course, writing at the end of the 5th century, uh, he said that if Sparta suddenly became deserted and only its buildings were left, he says, quote, future generations would hardly believe that the city in reality had been as powerful as it was, end quote. And Thucydides goes on to say that if Athens suffered the same fate, in other words, if everybody suddenly disappeared and only the buildings were left, Thucydides says, quote, you would think from what you saw that the city, that is Athens, was in fact twice as powerful as it really was, end quote. So, from that, you can see how we get the adjective Spartan, right? The, uh, when we say something is Spartan, we mean that it's austere, without frills, frugal. And uh, that certainly is a quality of Spartan life. The Spartan lifestyle was certainly without frills. And indeed, as we can see from this quotation of, from, of Thucydides, the city of Sparta itself was not magnificent. It was very plain. Um, and in fact, it, this is certainly um, to be seen if one goes to visit the area of Sparta um, uh, to this day, there aren't a lot of archaeological uh, remains left to be seen to, uh, to, to, to see what Sparta, ancient Sparta actually was like. If we now turn to look at Sparta in more detail, Sparta was originally founded when four small villages combined together. There's a wonderful highfalutin scholarly term for this. It's called synoikism. Uh, Sinoikism simply means kind of this conglomeration of various various disparate villages and and uh, kind of dwellings uh, th through the process of intermarriage and through perhaps a common common sense of mutual protection and so on, where small dwellings and villages coalesce into a larger town. Rome essentially comes about through this process. Um, Sparta, as I say, was originally founded when four small villages combined together. <clears throat> Later, it absorbed the town of Mik Amiklai, about three miles or four miles to its south. And by the 8th century BC, it had taken over all of Lyconia. So Sparta became the polis of Lyconia. During the Dark Ages, the reign of a single king ended. In the Bronze Age period, Sparta had been governed by a king, just like every other Bronze Age palace center. The most famous king of Sparta, in myth at least, was, of course, Menelaus, 
whose wife Helen had been abducted by the Trojans. But during the Dark Age period, as I said, the reign of a single king came to an end and power fell into the hands of noble families, just as was the case in other polis. But as we shall see, Sparta decided to be different even then. The Spartans got rid of the single king, but they replaced him with two kings. And during this period, then, that is during the Dark Ages and then going on to the Archaic period, Sparta was developing just like any other polis. It produced fine Laconian pottery, furniture, wine. Uh, Spartan poets also wrote pretty good poems. We have fragments from a Spartan poet named Tertius, for example. They're a bit different because, uh, that is, the Spartans were a bit different because they had two kings. But apart from that, Sparta was essentially developing just like any other polis. But then all of a sudden, this stopped. The Spartans stopped developing economically and culturally, like other polis uh, had been in the Archaic period, and they developed a unique political and social system, a system which excluded all luxury comforts, uh, everything that you can think of that might have frills attached to it, and, and focused with merciless singularity upon military uh, matters. These political and social developments were bound up with a man named Lycurgus, the legendary Spartan lawgiver. Lycurgus was essentially to Sparta what Solon was to Athens. It seems that Lycurgus brought a decree from the Oracle of Apollo at Delphi, which redefined or reformed the Spartan political structure, and it thenceforward became a mixture of monarchy, oligarchy, and democracy the famous Spartan politeia mictae, or mixed constitution of these three essential forms of government. And this immediately sets Sparta aside from other polis that we know about. Now we have a problem with Lycurgus, because while we know that Solon certainly existed, we cannot say the same for Lycurgus. He may have been a mythical figure invented by the Spartans later on in life so as to explain the origins of their constitution and society. And this is not as far-fetched as it sounds when one considers that the Romans pretty much did the same thing about their origins. Uh, wealthy Roman families quite late on in the Republic who patronize historical writers like Livy, who, do, who, account, who give the accounts of these early days of Rome, uh, uh, they were paying him and in the process they wanted their families elevated in the early history of Rome and so in other words these writers elevated the influence of their aristocratic families the uh, patrons and uh, that is why um, we have to take a lot of what we what Livy for instance writes about of those early days of Rome with a great uh, uh, you know piece of salt um, but the same is essentially true of Lycurgus. He may not have existed. And if he did, we don't know uh, when he was alive. Arguments range from the mid-9th century uh, to as late as the 7th century BC. Nowadays, the tendency is to place Lycurgus later. So that would be like in the late 8th century or early 7th century. But Whatever the case with that may be, what we can say is that if he did exist, he did not do everything that has been attributed to him. Like Solon, he started off the process of change and others completed that process. And this is certainly not a novel idea. Um, just like Solon, uh, we know that Lycurgus, if he did live at all, would have started off the process and others added to it because we know for a fact that later on in time, uh, an amendment was added to the decree that he supposedly brought back from Delphi, which redefined the Spartan constitution. Um, and this writer diminished the power of the Spartan assembly. Obviously, a writer or amendment is a later addition, uh, subsequent to the original one. And so he couldn't have uh, added that if he had a, if he brought back anything at all. So by the end of the seventh century, though. I think we are on reasonably safe ground in saying that the political and social system of Sparta had come into its full form. Uh, the decree about the Spartan constitution, the one that Lycurgus supposedly brought back from Delphi, was known as the Great Retra. Retra is simply the Greek word here for decree, something like constitution. Uh, and amazingly, the Retra is actually quoted in Plutarch's Life of Lycurgus. So as with Solon's poetry, history essentially comes alive, and 
uh, this is what Plutarch quotes. I'm going to read uh, now from the Retra as it is contained in Plutarch's Life of Lycurgus. When you have dedicated a temple to Zeus Salonius and Athena Salonia, and have arranged the people into Philae and Obai, and have established a Gerousia of 30 men, including the Archigatae, then from time to time, Apalazden, between Babica and Kanakion, in order to propose and dispense with measures, but decisions and power are to lie with the people. <laughs> okay, so I have left a lot of words there untranslated. Um, this is a very, very important document for us understanding how the uh, Spartan constitution operated. It basically describes the machinery of the constitution, but what does it mean? Well, let's break it down. The Spartans were first to be divided into various groups. That's what the Philae and the Obai mean. It's essentially like tribes, although we should do away with any, if, we, if when you think of, when you hear the word tribes, if you're thinking of like, you know, Native Americans or something like that, do away with that understanding. It's basically just like divisions among the people. Um, and the constitution uh, uh, that, that is brought back here for Sparta has this combination of those uh, monarchic and oligarchic or aristocratic and democratic elements. Um, and the, uh, in particular, this kind of oligarchical aspect of it is, or aristocratic aspect, is what is meant by the gerousia. This is a council of elders. The word geros simply means an old person. Our word ger geriatric or gerontology comes from that. And um, it, it, it has the precise same um, etymology in the sense of being connected to the word for elder that the Latin word senate does, the senatus, which has a bunch of senile people. You know, so you, of course, I'm just joking, but the word senile, senex, um, simply means very old in Latin. So again, the senatus of Rome was the council of elders. So the gerousia, precisely the same thing, council of elders. And this would include the two kings, uh, which the retra here refers to as the archigatai. So the archigatai are the kings, and they are part of the Gerousia, the Council of Elders. Um, and uh, then there also is the Assembly, which in Athens, we remember, is called the Ecclesia. Here it is called the Apella. Here in Sparta, it is called the Apella. This is from a Greek verb meaning to hold an assembly, to assemble. Apelasdain is what you see here. Uh, so we have these three organs of the Spartan constitution in the, uh, in the retro. We have the kingship. That is the monarchical aspect. We have the Gerousia, which includes the two kings, but is its own thing. And that's the kind of oligarchical aspect of it, the Council of Elders. And then we have the Appella or the Assembly, which is the kind of like the democratic aspect of it. According to the Retra, this Appella was to meet regularly by the look of it. In fact, it would meet once a month. Right uh, or so when the moon was full. Meetings were to be held between Babica, which was apparently a bridge, and Kanakion, which is uh, a river. So in other words, the Apella would meet outside, just as the Athenian assembly or Ecclesia did. Uh, this is deliberate, uh, though, because according to Plutarch, Lycurgus believed that if people met inside an elaborately decorated room with, you know, all sorts of nice things like statues and paintings on the walls uh, and on the ceiling, the sort of thing that one might associate with Greek architecture, then you wouldn't focus on the business at hand. You would be too distracted looking at everything beautiful. Um, so Lycurgus wanted the Appella to meet outside because the people could only look at and be focused on the business at hand. They were really a kind of Spartan-like quality in, in our sense of the word. Uh, and the place where the Appella met was obviously one that everybody knew of. It was between this bridge and the river, kind of like how in New York we say things like, I'll meet you at the clock in Grand Central Station or at the fountain of Lincoln Center or something like that. Um, here is the retro again. Uh, when you have dedicated a temple to Zeus Salonius and Athena Salonia and arranged uh, the people into Philae and Obai and have established a Gerousia of 30 men, including the Archigatai, then from time to time Apelazdain between Babaka and Kanakion, in order to propose and dispense with measures. But decisions and power are to lie with the people. So hopefully that makes sense now. For some reason, Sparta retained the kingship, as I said, and this made it different from other poles. Although from the Retra, we see that there was a dual monarchy, that is two kings, the king's powers were not absolute. Uh, 
uh, they were members of the Gerusia, which means that the other members of the Gerusia might have had some sort of check on the power of the kings. So the kings were not absolute monarchs as they were had been in the Bronze Age. At the same time, though, these kings were not just figureheads. They did have judicial powers. They certainly had religious functions. And in that sense, they might have very well been akin to sort of the chief priests of Spartan society, making public sacrifices on behalf of the state. We know that they did this at a later period. And most importantly, they were the commanders of the army. And they were expected to lead it in battle and to set an example uh, for the troops. Now, whether they could exert any influence in the Gerousia because of their status, that is, because of the fact that they were kings, is unknown. But their influence in the state was shown, as I said, by their having to lead by example. Uh, it was expected, for instance, that the kings would fight bravely in battle so as to set the right example for everyone to follow. This is certainly one reason, uh, the reason why Leonidas, the Spartan king, stood firm in 480 BC against the Persians at Thermopylae, uh, despite being massively outnumbered. Uh, he and the famous 300 Spartans fought to the death, because if they had not, if Leonidas had uh, gone back home to fight another day, he wouldn't have lived up to the expectation of being a Spartan king. There was very much this sense uh, that the king sets the cultural tone for the nation. This is something that perhaps uh, the, our cousins across the pond in England uh, might have uh, a better feeling for something that we don't really appreciate as much on an intuitive level in America, the idea of the monarch setting the kind of cultural tone for the state. But that certainly was the case in England. Now, why there were two kings is not properly known. The Spartans were certainly conservatives to an extent they might not have wanted to get rid of the kingship as other states had done and therefore they might want to have wanted to maintain some kind of continuity with the Bronze Age. We sort of can argue that the Athenians did something like that, because remember, they had kept that office of the Archon Basileos. Basileos means king, and therefore it is some continuity with the Bronze Age, although the, the Archon Basileos was not really a king. Uh, he was just kind of the official in charge of religious functions. Whereas the Spartans did have, in fact, real kings. Um, but this still wouldn't explain why there would be two and not just one. The most plausible explanation, the, the one that most scholars kind of commonly accept nowadays, is that one king would lead the army into battle, one king would leave Sparta on campaign, that is, while the other would stay behind to play a role in civic affairs. Uh, and more importantly, he would stay there so as to ensure continuity if the king that went out to battle were killed in battle. Um, now, that's possible. Another explanation, which I think we cannot disregard, is that these two kings always came, the, the fact is that these two kings always came from the same two families. Herodotus, our historical source uh, for much of the Persian Wars, tells us this. That there were these two family dynasties, the Agid dynasty and the Europontid dynasty, and he actually gives the lineages of them. And this perhaps was done so as to solve a dispute at the end of the Bronze Age between sort of two super aristocratic families, two highest of the high blue bloods, uh, and this dispute over who would furnish the king uh, that going forward couldn't be resolved. And so what did they do? They resolved it by striking a compromise, saying, let's forget about having just one king, let's have two, one from each of the two families. That is certainly a possibility. Now, the Gerousia, that other that organ inside of the Spartan constitution of this period that I've said is sort of the oligarchic or aristocratic element of their constitution. It is a council of elders. That is usually how it would be translated. Um, and it, it was comprised of 30 men. Uh, it was made up of, uh, as I said, uh, the two kings uh, and then 28 nobles. So making a, a total of 30. Um, and all of these people had to be over the age of 60. Uh, they held office for life, and since only nobles could become members of the Gerousia, the body was obviously aristocratic in con con uh, constitution, I'm sorry, composition. Uh, so it's something like the Areopagus in Athens. Uh, the Gerousia prepared the agenda for the assembly, and it introduced the matters to be discussed. Um, but this could not happen, the appella could not vote, that is, until the members of the Gerousia had debated uh, and the agenda items uh, were issued um, 
with their own reactions and their own kind of recommendations to them. The Gerasia also had some judicial functions, which included hearing cases for homicide and treason, both of which carried the death penalty. Um, these were serious crimes, therefore, and therefore the, the serious council of the Gerasia had to hear them. The process of election to the Gerasia is interesting. Plutarch tells us that when one of its members died, the people were brought together in an appella, in an assembly, to elect the successor. And the candidates paraded themselves before the people, and as they did so, the people shouted for each one. And the one who received the loudest shout won. This is what is often as referred to in our sources as acclamation. It sounds so much better than shouting, but that is what it was. Well, finally, our third organ in the Spartan constitution, as described in the Retra, is the appella itself, the assembly. The appella was open to full male citizens over the age of 30, who were known as Spartiates. Now, I say full, in the sense of full citizens, because only those men who had successfully completed the system of military training, called the agoge, that we're going to focus on later on today, um, only those who survived the agoge, and I mean literally survived, because many died in the process, um, and then also kept up their membership in, of the barracks that they were assigned to, uh, where they lived until the time that they were married, and then uh, continued to keep up their barracks uh, duty, uh, uh, kind of dues that you had to pay for membership in those barracks. Only those who did those, both of those two things were considered to be full Spartiates. If someone did not graduate from the Agoge, uh, or could not keep up his membership in the barracks, then he was known as an inferior this is sometimes translated in English um, translations of primary sources as a trembler. Um, but the word is, is really more an inferior. He did not have the same political and judicial rights as the full Spartiates. So you, you can have Spartiates, full Spartan citizens, and then you can have Spartans who are tremblers or inferiors. So when I'm talking about Spartans, I generally mean the full citizens, the Spartiates. There was still equality, though even though you had Spartiates and Tremblers uh, or inferiors, in the sense that a citizen, a Spartan citizen, could not be sold into slavery by another citizen. So even the Tremblers were homoioi with the Spartiates in that sense. Um, and this is not the case, we might just hasten to add, uh, as we've seen in pre salonian Attica, right? Athens did not have the same kind of law uh, from its earliest days. The Appella had no right of debate. The people simply voted yes or no to a particular proposal put forth by the Gerousia, and of course, decisions were made by shouting. Uh, again, we note that shouting element, something that Aristotle, interestingly enough, he commented on and found it to be very puerile. Um, but nevertheless, we have this mixed constitution. We have monarchy, oligarchy, and democracy. And there, there is an addition to this system as time goes on, um, because at some point, as I said, an amendment or rider was added to the retra by the kings Polydorus and Theopompus. And this rider muzzled the political power of the appella. Plutarch quotes the, the, this amendment, this rider, and I would just like to uh, read it to you now. It says, quote, if the people should make a crooked decision the elders and the archigatai, that is the kings, should discount it. Okay, uh, I'll just read that again. If the people should make a crooked decision, the elders, that is the members of the Gerousia, and the kings should discount it. In other words, if the people in the appella voted in a way that the Gerousia did not like, uh, and that, that, that is, of course, what they mean by voting in a crooked manner, then the Gerousia could render the decision null and void. We do not know when or why the, this amendment or rider was introduced, other than the fact that Plutarch says that the appella had been messing around with proposals for some time. Uh, so evidently the Gerousia had gotten tired of this and decided enough was enough. It is interesting to note how this amendment was passed, because we think that the people would be absolutely against it. It was essentially muzzling their power in the state. And Plutarch goes on to quote a few lines from the poet Tertius, and he tells us that these two kings, Polydorus and Theopompus, brought the rider from Delphi. And he goes on to say that these two kings said that Apollo was saying only the Gerousia and the kings were to rule Sparta. Uh, 
So this, I think, is another nice example of the political exploitation of religion, something that we've seen several times already in our course, and certainly we will not uh, uh, have to go very long before we will see again in, the, in Greek history. Uh, how could the people not accept an amendment and not vote in accordance with the Gerosia's wishes when Apollo, after all, had said that this was the way it had to be? Now, there is one other addition to the Spartan constitution not mentioned in the Retra, um, and that is the introduction of a body known as the Ephorate, okay, or the, the body of Ephors. Every year, the Appella elected five Ephors, uh, E-P-H-O-R-S. These basically, the word itself means overseer. And these five men had to all be over the age of 30, and they served only for one year, and re-election was not possible. Uh, one of them would be the eponymous Ephor, uh, he gave his name to the year that is, just like the eponymous Archon in Athens, you recall. The Ephorate was another democratic feature of the Constitution, although when it was added is unknown. Obviously, it is later than the Retra, because there is no mention of it in the Retra. The office seems to have had something to do with the kings, as the Ephors had a monitor, monitoring duty over them. For example, two of the ephors always went with a king when he left on campaign so as to monitor his activities. Uh, we'll talk about the ephors more as we go on, uh, and that's all I really want to say about it now, other than to say that they would eventually acquire a lot of power in Sparta. And I'll just finish up this introductory portion of the lecture now by making some comparisons and contrast between the Athenian and the Spartan constitutions. Um, You've probably already been thinking about this. It's pretty clear that Sparta was an oligarchy given the power of the Gerosia. Um, it had the power to render a decision of the appellant null and void, and this sort of thing could not happen in Athens. I said earlier that the Gerosia looked very much like the Areopagus. Uh, it was, after all, uh, very much like it in the sense that both are aristocratic councils, uh, the members of both hold office for life, but the Areopagus did not introduce the agenda to the Ecclesia, the Athenian Assembly, uh, and the Areopagus did not issue resolutions. Uh, the Areopagus certainly could not overturn a decision of the Ecclesia, so and all, those are all things the Gerosia could do as far as the Apella went, so those are very big differences right there. But perhaps the biggest difference in these, constitution, in these constitutions, aside from the fact of the dual monarchy, is the rights and powers of the assemblies themselves. In Sparta, the Spartan assembly, the Appella, didn't have the right to debate. All it could do was vote yes or no to a proposal by shouting, <laughs> and its decision could be overturned. In Athens, on the other hand, the Ecclesia, uh, the assembly did not, I'm sorry, did have the right to debate, and it voted much, in a much more civilized manner by a show of hands. Um, and however it voted, whether it was yes or no to a proposal, that could not be overturned. But it is not just this mixed constitution that makes the Spartans different from other Greeks. It is really their system of military education and how their society was organized. And it is to these aspects that I now want to turn and discuss. Um, and in particular, I would like to talk about the uh, brutal system of education that was instituted no in Sparta known as the Agoge. Um, now, we started off talking about Lycurgus and how he brought about these reforms in, uh, in the political order of Sparta. Um, but there are other uh, uh, reforms that he also was uh, was attributed to having enacted, um, particularly in terms of so in the social and economic spheres. And one of these um, reforms was the redistribution of the land of Laconia. Apparently, Lycurgus tried to redress the inequality between the people vis-a-vis -vis the land. He seems to have taken the land, that is the land of Laconia, uh, that is, and simply parceled it out in equal shares amongst everyone. Perhaps this is why the farmers in Attica were badgering for land redistribution, knowing what had happened to the Spartans. You remember that that was one of the things they asked and, and were agitating for Solon to do, and he did not do. Maybe this was why, because they knew it had happened in Sparta. Uh, be that as it may, Lycurgus's land redistribution must have taken place after Sparta became the polis of Laconia, but certainly and 
allotment, an allotment of land was something a man could and did expect when he completed the military system of education, uh, which we will talk about in a moment. But this land allotment, we need to know more about this. This was called a cleros, um, but it had more than a symbolic meaning, uh, the way that I say graduation present would have nowadays. Um, a man had to have a cleros to be recognized as a Spartan citizen, as a Spartiate. And what it produced, its crops, was his income. The income that allowed him the leisure time to fight in the army, to train, of course, on a daily basis, and to retain membership in his barracks. One other major reform attributed to Lycurgus, which I've mentioned a couple of times now, but we're now going to turn our uh, attention to in detail, was the system of military training called the Agoge. And this was coupled with the introduction of common mess halls or barracks. This system of military discipline became the core of a Spartan man's education in the state. And I think it is what really characterized Spartan society the most. The agoge was compulsory for all males. Until the age of seven, both boys and girls played together and trained together in the nude, I might add. Uh, this, the other Greeks thought, by the way, was a bit off. Um, uh, but nevertheless, uh, the, the boys that made it this far, that is to the age of seven, um, well, I should actually just mention that right now. Uh, the first act of any child, uh, the first act, well, I should say the first action done to any child after it was born, um, we are told in multiple sources, the first thing that would happen would be that the parents, the father in particular, would take the male baby to the eldest of member of his tribe, and this person would inspect the baby, and if the baby was deemed fit, in other words, if it had all of its fingers and toes, if it didn't have some kind of congenital birth defect or some other for, some sort of deformity, then if the baby were healthy, it would be assigned a cleros for when it, he would graduate the agoge later on in life. Now, if the baby were not healthy, Okay, if it were deformed and it had some kind of birth defect or something like that, it would be exposed, that is, left on the slopes of Mount Tigatus so as to die. And according to Plutarch in his life of Lycurgus, uh, leaving the baby out to die was considered, quote, better for the child as well as for the state, end quote. Now, this is particularly ghastly stuff. Uh, it is one of the aspects of Spartan society that um, certainly is horrifying uh, to us moderns. Uh, of course, uh, uh, under the influence of 2,000 years of Christianity. But we have to remember that throughout the entire ancient world, the exposure of infants, um, and not, not just necessarily ones that were even physically deformed in some ways, but perhaps just unwanted for whatever reason, girls uh, in, and um uh, or just, you know, or a male child uh, that was not uh, desired for whatever reason. Um, exposure of infants was a very common thing. But what marked the Spartan exposure of infants off as distinct is the fact that it was not the parents who decided which child uh, would be exposed and left to die. It was the state. And it was for the, the, the end of the state. And it was specifically done if a child were deformed in some ways. Now, there have been a lot of people throughout history who have thought that this was a great idea. Uh, and uh, to show you just how it has trickled down throughout the ages, it, there are some surprising uh, voices uh, that have that have uh, endorsed this sort of behavior, and some that are rather not surprising. Uh, not surprisingly, we can see quotes from Hitler, for instance, in Mein Kampf. Um, I'll just read it to you right now. Quote, the abandonment of sick, puny, and misshapen children by the Spartans was more humanitarian and in reality a thousand times more humane than the pitiful madness of our present time, where the most sickly subjects are preserved at any price, only to be followed by the breeding of a race from degenerates burdened with disease. That probably does not surprise us that he felt that way, given the, uh, his later actions. Uh, more surprisingly might be somebody from our own country of America, Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, who uh, was also a eugenicist and uh, was uh, very much in favor of Justice Reading and talks about it with approval in her own writings. Now, putting that to the side now, at 
age seven, both girls and boys in Spartan society were segregated. Girls carried on uh, living at home, though they still underwent physical training. But at age seven, the boys left their homes and they went to live in a military mess hall, barracks, uh, if you like. And this was this barracks was known as a susitian. Uh, there were a number of these mess halls. These the plural would be susitia. Um, and modern historians estimate that each one had in it perhaps 16 to 20 or so males. So it wasn't enormous, like a big dormitory or youth hostel, but it was something. It was substantial in a sense. The boys probably went to the same susitian as their fathers. Uh, so they followed in a sort of family tradition, kind of like uh, if you have a relative that graduated from a university, you have a, a better chance of getting accepted into it. Um, the parents grew into men in their susitia uh, because they lived in this mess hall from the age of seven, when they would leave for their mothers, leave their mothers to go live in this mess halls until the age of 30. Okay, so from the age of seven to 30, they were not allowed to move into their own homes until they hit the age of 30. Interestingly enough, though, oddly enough, they were allowed to marry, usually in their early 20s. But then they had to visit their wives in secret. Only when there was a, there was no moon, we are even told. This is a very odd practice to us. And it is described and then explained by Plutarch in his Life of Lycurgus. He says the following, um, that the Spartan husband, quote, took care to visit his wife secretly, ashamed and anxious in case he was seen by someone in his house. His wife came up with all sorts of intrigues and schemes about how they could meet up with each other and no one would see them. The young husbands would do this sort of thing, not for a short period of time, but it went on and on so that they might have, it might even have children before finally they saw their own wives in the daylight. Now, very odd indeed. There are two things at work here, though. There is this shame factor, aidos is the Greek word, um, the shame factor from being seen, since stealth was considered very important to a Spartan soldier. Obviously, if you're going to be a you know, good soldier, there has to be, you can't be just waltzing around, you know, you have to know how to use stealth and, and so on. Um, but there is also this belief that is widely uh, held among ancient writers and indeed uh, modern writers too, to some degree, uh, uh, the, uh, really based around the idea of self-control and not being given over to, uh, given over to overindulgence. That is, if, if you had your Sparty soldiers just kind of lounging around and, you know, eating grapes and, and uh, chilling out with their wives all the time, uh, that would not be conducive to the sort of rugged and merciless militarism that was so cultivated in Sparta. So I think that's really a big part of what's going on here. Uh, now, the upshot of this system is that by the time graduates of the Agoge could move into their own homes at the age of 30, they might already have one or two children, the eldest of which could be four or five, uh, and indeed be therefore be on the, the verge of going and living in the Susitian himself and begin the, beginning the Agoge. Even when husbands were allowed to live in their own home, they were still required to spend every weekend in the Susitia and to eat dinner there every evening with their comrades. Um, this was because Spartan men were required to serve in the army until the staggering age of 60. That is not a young man anymore. And yet they still were to be in active duty, as it were. So training needed to be ongoing all throughout one's life, basically, even after graduating the Agoge. We're going to see, actually, that that same king, that Thermopylae, Leonidas, he was in his 60s when he was fighting that brutal battle. Imagine that, a man in his 60s, you know, fighting for three days straight, uh, uh, you know, just hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat, up close and impersonal, uh, up, uh, you know, uh, killing one's enemies with a, with a spear and a sword. Um, incidentally, we shouldn't see these mess halls and these dinners that take place there as anything like the drinking parties, the symposia that I've described to you in Athens, remember with the Kotobos game where the men would sit around throwing their dregs of their red wine at things and doing drinking games and stuff like that, discussing philosophy. And uh, the Spartans were really quite different from that. Uh, um, firstly, they drank very, they drank alcohol very sparingly. Um, again, this idea of self-control, they were very well aware of the dangers of getting drunk and of the kind of, you know, 
uh, impertinence that that can lead to. Uh, and then furthermore, the food that they, ha- that they had to look forward to was really nothing very good at all. In fact, um, the standard meal that they ate was something called melos zomos, which means black soup. And it was uh, in- uh, made up of pig blood, vinegar, and salt, basically. I think maybe some grain thrown in there, like barley or something like that. But it was uh, it, it was a very, very Spartan kind of uh, place. And in fact, there is this funny story about a Greek who came from the, the town of Sybaris, which is uh, a place in, in southern Italy, which uh, it was a place known for its luxurious eating. In fact, if you know the English word Sybarite, means somebody who's like a gourmand, who really loves his food and delicate dining. Well, he came once to visit the Spartans and, uh, and sat down at one of their dinners. And he said, uh, now, that I've, uh, now that I've tasted what the Spartans food is like, I can see why they no longer fear death. Uh, <laughs> because of course, death is as nothing. Uh, to them once they once you know if this is what life is considered you know like with their food the training of the Agoge was often very brutal we don't have a lot of information about this but we do know the broad outlines there was no instruction in in reading and writing and arithmetic certainly current affairs philosophy nothing like that at all the emphasis in the Agoge and indeed the emphasis in all of Spartan society was on physical toughness obedience fighting hoplite uh, battles and of course as i said before stealth at the age of seven the young boys were divided into what the spartans called herds for their physical and obedience training at age 12 they cut their hair short and they moved to what today we might call military maneuvers this would be something like being dropped off in the middle of nowhere and having to find your way home with only a, a compass and perhaps some other minor uh, medical uh, supplies and rations in your pockets um In Sparta, though, the boys were habitually starved for food and water, uh, sometimes as long as for a week before sending them out into the middle of nowhere so as to survive. Of course, the whole idea was if you were on campaign, there would be oftentimes times when uh, there is no food. Um, They did not have uniforms, in fact. They only wore a single cloak all year round, and they had no shoes. Sometimes they were even forced to go out into the fields on these maneuvers totally naked. Um... They had to forage to survive. They had to steal. And if they were caught stealing, they were punished not for the crime, but for being caught. And these maneuvers went on throughout the year. It didn't matter if there was snow on the ground, as, some, as would happen in the mountains, um, or in uh, you know, the middle of the blazing heat uh, in midsummer. At the age of 14, the boys became known as ephibs, kind of like cadets. And while the sort of training that I've just been talking about continued, that is being dropped in the middle of nowhere and uh, having, you know, just with a compass and a banana in your pocket, um, they began to talk, uh, take part in military campaigns. And this period as an ephib would last until about the age of 20 or so when they would grow their hair long again and also their distinctive Spartan beards. Um, uh, this was a, a long beard with no mustache. Um, And they would have long hair. All the Spartans famously had very long hair. And as I said, at this age, in the early 20s, give or take, a Spartan would be allowed to marry, but he had to continue on living in the Susitian until he was 30 years old. And at that point, when he was 30, when he graduated, he would receive that kleros that had been assigned to him by his tribal uh, elder after he had just been born. And at that point, he would become a full Spartan citizen or Spartiate. And to maintain this status, he had to continue paying his mess hall duties. Um, money, that would be, um, uh, but it was, it was not actually, um, it, it was usually in the form of produce, so, so grain and wine and those kind of things, oil, um, uh, that, uh, that had to be contributed to the mess hall. And if he did not do this, or if he could not, um, then he would be no longer considered a spartiate. A lot of Spartan boys and men must have failed the Agoge. Some would have died in training or simply dropped out. And we know, as I said before, that this happened because there was this particular status called the inferiors or the tremblers for those that had not graduated. These unfortunate wretches had to wear colored patches on their cloaks. Uh, And when they were adult males, they were not allowed to wear the full Spartan beard. This meant that they were instantly recognizable. So again, it's that shame factor. Um, uh, 
ashamed not just for themselves but also for their families uh they had let their family down as it were as well as the state uh they hadn't made it through the ago gay people would turn their backs on them literally they were looked at as being certainly inferior in society the goal of the ago gay was twofold it was to produce first-rate soldiers to fight and to die for the state without question and secondly it was on a practical level to train future members of a secret police force that Sparta used called the Kruptea. The Kruptea tracked the activities of the Spartan slaves, or helots, as they were called, and the word itself basically means captive. And these helots posed a big threat to domestic security. As I said before, they were essentially the Achilles heel of Sparta. And I want to talk about them more, but later on be, uh, today, because they fit into a better place later on now. But to the Spartans, um, I'll just return now to their kind of the general contours of their society. Politics and home life came second. And this was something that the Athenians, indeed the Greeks overall, could not understand. The Athenians, the Greeks generally, of course, recognized the need to fight. They were not pacifists in any way. They thought that there was nothing nobler than dying to protect one's way of life and one's city's freedom. But this for the rest of the Greeks, was not to be the be-all and the end-all of their role in society. Involvement in civic life was paramount to the Athenians, for example, um, but they had schools where one could learn rhetoric and philosophy. Um, of course, through conversation and dialogue, their citizens could learn and talk about politics and current affairs. Again, the Spartans' attitude to civic life and what they considered important, fighting versus taking part in the political system and learning things. This really helps us to understand why they were looked at as being so different by the other Greeks. And it's not just uh, us that can look at the Spartans and say they really have a very different lifestyle than everybody else. The other Greeks, their own contemporaries, felt this way too. And we gain a, a vivid insight into this and into what life in the Agrigae was like from Plutarch's Life of Lycurgus. And also from that other work I mentioned at the start of our lecture today, um, that work by the 4th century BC writer Xenophon called The Constitution of the Spartans. And I'm just going to read you now an extract from Xenophon because it really brings to life the Algo Gay and what life was like in it far better than uh, if I just uh, describe it. Uh, because this is a contemporary Greek writing about it. So this is what he says. Rather than letting boys' feet grow soft in shoes, he, that would, of course, be um, Lycurgus, told them emphatically to make them strong by not wearing shoes, in the belief that this practice should enable them to walk uphill with greater ease and come down in greater safety. And the boy who is accustomed to having no shoes on his feet should jump and bound and run faster than the one with shoes. And instead of their clothes serving to make them delicate, he required them to become used to a single garment all the year round, the idea being that thereby they would be better prepared for both cold and heat. As for food, he instructed the Ayurain to furnish for the common meal just the right amount for them, never to become sluggish through being too full, uh, while also giving them a taste of what it was not to have enough. This sort of thing was to help the men when they were on campaign, as I said. They would be better able to handle the hardships of war, uh, if there were times when they could not get enough food, well, they were used to this feeling of being hungry anyway, so it wouldn't affect their ability to fight. And certainly, you know, throughout a day-long battle, uh, one cannot imagine the amount of physical um, deprivation and hardship that one must go through. You know, if you're hungry, it doesn't matter. You've got to keep fighting. If you're tired, it doesn't matter. You keep fighting. If you're wounded and so on. So this idea of kind of putting off one's you know, suppressing one's physical needs or overlooking one, one's physical desires uh, for the sake of uh, militarism. Uh, you know, it is, it is no accident that one of the greatest um, uh, historians of the ancient world, Theodore Mommsen, referred to the Spartans as military monks. Uh, and that gives you some kind of idea of what, of what we're dealing with here. Um, Xenophon continues, though, and I would just like to continue the, with this quote. On the other hand, while he, like Lycurgus, did not allow them to take what they required effortlessly so as to prevent them suffering from hunger, he did permit them to engage in some stealing in order to ward off starvation. 
I imagine everyone is aware that he did not let them get food by trickery because he was unable to provide for them. Clearly, a prospective thief must keep awake at night and by day must practice deception and lie in wait, as well as having spies ready if he is going to seize anything. So clearly it was Lycurgus's wish that by training the boys in all these ways, he should make them more resourceful at feeding themselves and better fighters. Someone might ask them, if he considered theft a good thing, why on earth did he inflict many lashes on the boy who was caught? My answer is because, as in every other branch of instruction, people chastise anyone who does not respond satisfactorily. So the Spartans, too, punish those who are caught as being incompetent thieves. And after making it a matter of honor for them to snatch just as many cheeses as possible from Oerthia, uh, this is a shrine of, of Artemis, in Laconia, he commanded others to whip them, wishing to demonstrate thereby the point that a short period of pain may be compensated by the enjoyment of long-lasting prestige. We see in these extracts the measures taken in the aggregate to toughen boys into men, so as to improve their abilities to steal, to be able to run, and to fight better all of which would benefit them and their fellow soldiers when on campaign. The brutality of the system is well illustrated in this little cryptic anecdote that he, Xenophon ends here about the boys stealing cheese. This was an annual ritual whereby boys would try to steal cheeses off the altar of Artemis or Arthea, uh, and the older boys were to guard that altar with whips and whip them so as to prevent them from stealing the cheeses. The idea was that those youngsters would be trained to resist pain. They weren't supposed to cry out as they were being whipped, uh, because, of course, that would be unmanly. We're told that the altar would be drenched in their blood uh, from these whippings, and that at times some of these boys died during this horrifying ritual. They died from the whippings. There would be a big group of spectators of other Spartans watching this, and uh, it makes us think, if, if you thought the Romans were bloodthirsty, uh, you know, they've got nothing on the Spartans, it seems. Um, and we note also from this passage that I just read that the boys were not beaten for committing the crime. This was where the stealth training comes in. The idea was that this would to be a, you had to be a good, artful dodger and that these types of, of skills would better enable them to infiltrate enemy lines and enemy camps when on campaign, especially uh, when those people, uh, when they would have to become members of that secret police force, the Corruptea, that I've talked about already. Um, this all explains why a Spartan was punished if, for example, he was caught stealing. The crime itself did not matter. What did was being caught. Um, and that is another reason why it was, uh, why they had this whole thing about, you know, it was considered to be shameful to be seen visiting one's wife before you were allowed to live at home. In fact, there is even the story of this whole idea of being punished for stealing, and, uh, only for being caught stealing, not actually for the act itself of, Plutarch tells us in one of his works, that a young boy captured a fox and uh, so as to kill it and eat it, but he was, uh, he was caught by his... Uh, you know, commandant or whatever, his, you know, drill instructor. And he was standing there with the fox hidden underneath his cloak, and it was around his stomach, and the drill instructor was chewing him out, yelling at him about whatever it was, maybe, you know, obviously trying to emotionally traumatize him as well as physically. And the whole time he was standing there hiding this fox in his cloak, it was gnawing away at his stomach and ultimately disemboweled him. And yet uh, he only finally... Uh, led on to the fact that this was happening when he just collapsed and basically died on the spot because of this. Um, now, that story may well be apocryphal, but it does express this kind of idea of what, you know, what the Spartan life was like. Another aspect of the aggregate system, uh, one that it spawned anyway, uh, was what we might call institutionalized homosexuality. Uh, in other words, as the boys grew up with one another in their Susitian, remember this would be from the age of about 7 to 30, friendships would develop that often would turn sexual. Uh, this was something that the state condoned. However, Lycurgus apparently cracked down hard on any man who pursued a boy just for his body, that is, just for the lust factor. Um, but as long as someone was of the right character, this is you know, the, the, this was the 
social mores um, of the time. As long as someone was of the putatively right character who befriended a boy first, uh, got to develop some kind of friendship, then out of that friendship, if the relationship turned sexual, that was deemed okay. In a place like a Susitian, with males living in it from the ages of 7 to 30, the number of same-sex relationships must have been substantial. And um, now this, this may strike us as being, again, quite unusual. Um, we might take a step back and we say there seems to be something kind of contradictory there when you have this, you know, uber macho, tough kind of society. Um, why would the Spartans engage uh, in and encourage this sort of behavior? Um, and uh, the answer to that is that there, there's more than just the physical side of these relationships, uh, not just in Sparta, but actually throughout Greece as a whole at this time. Uh, there is a military factor. Everything kind of boils down to its military factor in Sparta. And the idea was that in battle, soldiers would be fighting on behalf of the state. Yes, of course they were. But they would also be fighting in the eyes of and kind of to protect their lovers. And hence, they would fight more ferociously, it was thought, to protect their lovers as they stood next to them in the line of battle. And this idea is actually not unique to Sparta, as I said, um, but can be found elsewhere in Greece. Uh, for instance, there was a very famous elite corps of soldiers from Thebes known as the Sacred Band. And uh, we will actually return to them later on down the line because they will ultimately fight to, uh, against Alexander the Great. But um, this was an elite infantry force, something akin to the American Special Forces, uh, Green Berets or something like that the creme de la creme, that is, of the army. And it was composed of 300 men, uh, but, they, it, but it was also composed of, uh, of those, those 300 men were really 150 pairs of lovers. And this was deliberate, the idea being that these men would fight more ferociously for each other. Uh, they would stand more firm against the enemy because of their relationships. And this was perhaps one reason why just to kind of, again, jump back to the Alexander the Great episode, the, the entire sacred band of Thebes refused to budge at the Battle of Chironia in Boeotia in 338 BC, where Philip II of Macedonia defeated the Greeks and imposed Macedonian hegemony over, Greeks, uh, over the, Greece, the Greeks. And in that battle, Philip's 18-year-old son, Alexander, annihilated the entire sacred band. Um, but because it did not move, it refused to turn and, and run, and therefore was cut down to the last man. All in all, graduates of the Agoge in Sparta certainly earned their kleros, I would say. If they survived through the brutal training, they, um, uh, they certainly needed that allotment of land. And we can see why the Spartan army earned the reputation that it did as the best trained and toughest fighting force in Greece. There was no question that the fame of the Spartan army spread far and wide because of this. It reached as far afield as Asia Minor, for example, as we will see later on. Everyone essentially had heard of the Spartans. Everyone admired the Spartan army. But the lifestyle uh, and what society expected of the Spartans was something really quite... Um, you know, it, it had it certainly had a very uh, it was remorseless, it was merciless, and it therefore was, you know, um, had its downsides. And that's why I said that the other Greeks both admired and, uh, and I would even go so far as to say detested the Spartans at the same time. Um, now, we've been talking a lot about Spartan males, uh, but if you think the Spartan women got off easy in this system, think again. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, at age seven, boys and girls would be separated, with the boys going to live in the Susitian uh, with their their fathers. Uh, well, I'm sorry, no, the father, the, the Susitian that their father was a member of, and they would stay there until the age of thirty. Girls, though, continued living on at home, where they were looked after by their mothers, uh, but they would also have a physical training, and uh, the, the idea behind which was to make them strong and healthy, um, because. The job of, a, of Spartan society, uh, that Spartan society had for women and the expectation that they had for them was, of course, to run the oikos, perhaps uh, like, like at Athens, but even more particularly to bear strong babies. Okay, that was their duty to the state. Men had their duty to the state of fighting. Women had their duty to the state. Uh, by giving birth to strong babies, especially, of course, strong male babies, because these strong babies would grow up 
uh, either to fight for Sparta if they were boys or if they were girls to bear other strong babies. So you can see how the whole system is interpenetrated. And so what I'd like to do now is to turn uh, to um, to discussing women's place inside of Sparta. Um, and then I want to discuss why the Agoge was introduced and when. And then I want to bring in the rise of the Peloponnesian League, this league which would propel the Spartans into the wider arena of Greek affairs. Let's, though, begin with the women. Spartan women had more independence and rights than their counterparts in Athens. There's a very big difference between women in Sparta and women in Athens. For example, women in Sparta could own land, even if they had brothers. And in the 4th century BC, Aristotle actually talks of two-fifths of the land of Laconia being owned by women. Aristotle doesn't think uh, that this is good. He thinks that women should not own land because elsewhere in Greece they don't, but that's another issue. Um, it's another reason, actually, why the Spartans were looked at as so different from the other Greeks. Now, we've seen that the pleros, that allotment of land, was the basis for full citizenship in Sparta. So evidently there was also private ownership of land because Spartan women were not presented with kleroi, uh, only the male babies were, uh, which was then, of course, given to them once they graduated the Agoge. This situation, the fact that women owned land in Laconia, may be a reflection of the fact that by the 4th century BC, the Kleros ceased to be returned to the state when that Spartiate died. It remained rather now in the possession of his family. Either way, Spartan women could own land, and as I've said, this set them apart from other women in, on the, the rest of mainland Greece. Aristotle's point that two-fifths of the land of Laconia uh, were owned by women may not actually be an exaggeration, as is sometimes thought. There was a very high death rate among Spartan soldiers. You can imagine why, um, given the fact that they were trained to, to never run away, to, to fight to the death. Uh, and manpower declined dramatically during the classical period. This is something we're going to talk about again and again. Um, uh, both tonight, when we wrap up with Sparta and br bring in the Persians, and also going forward as 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 the decades will wear on in the in the fifth and the fourth century. Well, this decline in manpower, actually, and the fact that Spartan men were always busy in some way or another with warfare, also explains why Spartan women played a much more overt role in public life than elsewhere in Greece. Plutarch tells us this, that when that women play, played a far more hands-on role in public affairs than their counterparts in Athens. And he also says that the Spartan men allowed them to do this. In fact, Plutarch even says that the men of Sparta obeyed their wives, giving us something of an interesting window into the dynamic between the husband and wife in Sparta. Remember in Athens, the man, the husband, was the curios, of, uh, the master of the household. He wasn't going to take orders from his wife. But that was because Athenian society and its expectations were very different from the Spartan one. Women were expected to take more of a role in city life in Sparta because the men were always away fighting or on training missions. So if the lot of the Spartan man was to graduate the Agoge and fight for the state, then the lot of the Spartan woman was to bear strong babies, as I've said. And this is why the lifestyle of girls and boys in Sparta were so utterly different from those in Athens. Until the age of seven, as I said, boys and girls trained together in Sparta. And Plutarch, in his life of Lycurgus, tells us that this was to help them cope, that is the girls, to help them cope better with pregnancy and to produce stronger babies. Uh, Plutarch says this quite explicitly. Lycurgus, he says, made the girls physically strong by having them run, wrestle, and throw the discus and javelin so that their children, even in the womb, would have a strong start in fit bodies and so develop better. And the women would handle their pregnancies well and give birth successfully and in relaxed fashion. Uh, now, just as a small aside, I have six children <laughs> and I have been present at the birth of all of them. And the idea of anyone having a relaxed uh, uh, birth is, is kind of hard for me to imagine. I, uh, one day, if you haven't ever experienced that, <clears throat> uh, being present at, a, at the birth of a child, I hope you do. It is a really life-changing experience. But it, the idea of using the word relaxed there is, is somewhat uh, laughable. Well, even after the separation of boys and girls at age seven, the girls continued with their physical training. And as a result, Spartan women had a reputation among Greeks for toughness. In fact, in the comic 
a play by Aristophanes, Aristophanes known as the Lysistrata, which was a comedy produced in Athens in the year 411 BC, that is during the Great Peloponnesian War. A Spartan woman, a character in the play by the name of Lampito, is praised by Lysistrata, a woman, and complimented by her for her muscular physique and her physical prowess. Lampito replies by saying that she can still jump, and she's probably some point middle-aged by now, uh, she can still jump so high that she can kick her own buttocks with her feet before landing back on her feet again. Um, and this type of exercise, jumping up, kicking one's buttocks and getting one's feet down and flat again before you land, was apparently characteristic of the Spartans. And I can tell you it's not easy to do. Um, <laughs> but more than the reputation for toughness was the Spartan woman's attitude towards their children, her children, uh, particularly the Spartan woman's attitude towards her children dying nobly for the state. We hear of one mother, for example, whose son returned from battle. And when she asked how the battle had gone, he said, all have perished. Well, instead of being overjoyed that her son was the one who made it home safely, she grabbed a tile, the story goes, and threw it at him, killing him in the process saying, why was it that you alone were sent home to bring us the bad news? In other words, why did you not perish with your comrades in arms? Um, this brings shame on the family. Dishonor, then, was equally important for the family of the Spartiate as it was for the warrior himself. And I've mentioned this before, and I'll keep coming back to it, the shame factor. This is a very big aspect of Greek society, but particularly of Sparta uh, at this time. The only Spartans who were allowed to have their names on tombstones were those who, men who had died in battle and women who died in childbirth. Okay, and this explains why the Spartans stood fast in battle and died rather than uh, living, you know, running away to live uh, to fight another day, which, of course, is the way I would uh, prefer to behave. <laughs> but um, no, uh, the Spartans did not live by that at all. We know that the Spartan man could marry when he was in his 20s, but he couldn't move home and, and live at home until he was 30. And this meant that his children would have been brought up by the mother who was living at home all the time, and that the sons might experience home life with mom and dad living together under one roof only for a couple of years or so, if there was a son who was fast approaching seven when it was time for him to leave and join his own Susitian. The dynamic then between parents and children in Sparta was quite different from that uh, which obtained in Athens, where, of course, men... Um, uh, were home all the time. Uh, mom and dad would be home all the time. The children were born and they lived at home right away. Uh, it was basically like the nuclear family that we can relate to. Um, but any idea that Spartan children were smothered in some way because they were brought up with their mother always around is shown to be totally false by a number of sayings that are attributed to Spartan women about their children. And these stories circulated very widely in the Greek world. And actually Plutarch has an entire work, an entire little treatise known as The Sayings of the Spartan Women. And I'm just going to give you a small little smattering of them right now, some ones that are kind of famous and ones that are illustrative, I think, of the general ethos. One is that when an Athenian woman asked a certain woman named Gorgo of Sparta why it was that Spartan women were the only women to tell their men what to do, Gorgo replied that, quote, it was because Spartan women were the only ones who were mothers of real men. That's beef on my black. Another saying comes, uh, co co comes from a mother who was burying her own son. And as she does so, an older woman approaches her. who She offers her condolences and says, what bad fortune brought this upon you? And the mother replies, that is the mother burying her son, that it is not bad fortune, but rather good fortune, because she gave birth to him, quote, so that he might die for Sparta, and this is the one thing that has happened for me, end quote. And I cannot um, uh, give you a, a, a smattering of these famous sayings of the Spartan women without the most famous of them at all, uh, of, of all of them, one that was very celebrated uh, both in antiquity and in subsequent ages, and that was the traditional phrase that um, 
a, womb, a Spartan mother would say to her son as she bids him farewell when he goes off to battle. She would hand him his big shield and say, Etan e epetas, either this or on these. In other words, come back with your shield or on your shield like a stretcher dead, in other words. Now, I like to bring up modern day analogies uh, as much as I can, because I think they help us understand the ancient world in the best way that we possibly can. And when I have searched my mind for modern day analogies for this type of behavior, it's easy to just kind of blow it off as hyperbolic or even somewhat comical or something, but we really can't take it that way. We have to see it in, in earnestness, which is what the, this, all of these sayings and stuff like that, they weren't just jokes. And I think the best analogy that one can come up with, and it is a disturbing one, I will just warn you, um, but nevertheless, I think it is the most accurate one. The, the closest thing that we can see to this in our modern day um, world is that of the families, particularly the mothers of suicide bombers in the Middle East. Um, oftentimes these families, and particularly the mothers, appear uh, in television interviews uh, about their son or daughter who has just blown themselves up um, and killed a bunch of innocent people. They seem very proud and very uh, almost ecstatic sometimes about what their child has done. And I think probably more than anything else, this is the best analogy for Spartan mothers here, um, that uh, Spartan mothers really did look at their children as being that the, the greatest thing that they could have to offer would be to give them their lives on behalf of the state. And it is a sobering note, it is a disturbing analogy, as I said, but it is really one that helps the ancient world kind of uh, come more, uh, become more understandable to us, and for us moderns to get come to grips with what perhaps was, uh, you know, the, the mentality of, of this this portion of the ancient world. Well, because the Spartans were so obsessed with um, wives producing healthy male babies, male females in Sparta married later than they did elsewhere in Greece in their late teen years. The Spartans believed an older girl was better able to bear the burden of pregnancy and childbirth. Uh, and um, uh, this is something that then this is the reason why they, they married later than Greek girls in other parts of Greece. In Athens, for instance, uh, the husband was typically in his early 30s. So, so um, again, older than, uh, than the uh, Spartan male. But because the Athenians were so obsessed with their wives being virgins on marriage, um, and because Athenian society uh, placed such value on, on, on having legitimate children, that is, only legitimate children could inherit the oikos or family estate, and only legitimate children could become citizens and so on, um, then because of that, the Athenian men married girls around the age of 12 or 13. The girls would be around the age of 12 or 13. Um, so that was, so you can see how their own preoccupations caused them to do things differently. In Sparta, on the other hand, preoccupation with strong and plentiful male babies gave rise to the practice of marrying girls later in their teen years, but even of something more startling, of having common wives, where three or more men, very often brothers, uh, might indeed share a single wife, an offspring from these um extramarital liaisons, I guess is what they were, um, would belong equally to all of them. Uh, and, uh, or, or a particular couple if this was outside of the immediate family. And in fact, um, uh, the, uh, Plato in his Republic, he, when, if you ever read Plato's Republic, he talks about this, of having common wives, and he gets the idea totally from Sparta. Uh, he was a big admirer of Sparta on many levels. Um, now, don't, get for, don't think for a moment that this is somehow like modern day swinging or wife swapping or something like that. The Spartans were the most unswinger like people that one could come across in the ancient world. Um, but it really was all about, again, duty to the state and, um, and putting aside of personal feelings. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, so as for, for the good of the state, it was really something. In fact, Plutarch even says it's it just as it's logical to select the best parents when one is breeding horses or dogs. So the Spartans figure, why not do so with children? I'm paraphrasing, but that's essentially what he says. Domestic life then was radically different in Sparta than it was in, say, Athens. While wives tended to stay at home in both cities, in both polis, in Athens, the husband lived uh, at home all the time, but not so in Sparta until he was 30. Even then, remember, 
he was expected to live and eat in his Susitian in the evenings and on the weekends. By the time he moved home, his wife had established herself as head of the household, so she was seen as a sort of combination mother and father figure to the children. Also, as we've said already, if the husband happened to have impregnated his wife upon marriage in, the, in his 20s, um, he would have had no family life with his children, really, at all. And a son at the age of seven would be moving out of the house and into his own Susitian, basically around, perhaps around the same time that the father was now moving back into his house. A really odd situation. The relationship between parents and children was so very different in so many ways. And perhaps this is yet another reason why the Greeks looked down their noses as they did at the Spartans. Now, I've talked a fair bit about Spartan society and the aggregate, and now I would like to turn to a consideration of when and why the agoge was introduced. For these factors, we need to bring in the other type of people that the Spartans had intimate dealing with, uh, dealings with, and those would be the helots. So if you think being a trembler or an inferior or even a perioikos in Spartan society was bad, you wouldn't want to go back in your time machine and be a helot. Helots were state-owned serfs. They had no political, social, or judicial rights. They came along with the kleros, that allotment of land, when it was given to the successful graduate of the Agoge. Uh, a very weird sort of situation, because although the state of Sparta owned the helots, each Spartiate had his own, had his own kind of private bunch of helots working the land for him. They farmed his kleros because that was what enabled him to continue membership in his susition. If Plutarch has it right, he says that the helots gave 70 bushels of barley for each Spartan man and 12 bushels for his wife, along with oil and wine. They were allowed to keep the rest of their produce for themselves, though, and they could even sell any surpluses. But as long as they handed over what was expected of them, they were pretty much left alone to continue working the land. Working the land in this way, as I said, gave the Spartiate the means to pay his susitian dues, <clears throat> so as to maintain his membership in the barracks. It also gave him the leisure time to train and, of course, to fight uh, and to be carried back on his shield, if the case might be. This is important because we're not really talking about a conscript army here as elsewhere in Greece. This was the problem with conscript armies. You would have farmers, traders, merchants, you know, uh, th those hoplite uh, members that we talked about in Athens of the middle stratum of society who weren't fighting all the time. They were simply... Uh, doing their own civilian jobs, and then when the time came, they would be mustered and they would be called and would stop everything that they were doing in civilian life and uh, and then go to war. But they hadn't been training in military maneuvers all the rest of the year. The Spartans uh, were. They were professional soldiers. They were full-time soldiers all year round their whole lives. The Spartans needed to do this. They needed to have a professional army, uh, to use that term, um, because of their situation with the helots. I'm going to talk about that more in a moment. But the Spartan soldier could not um, spend all of his time, you know, farming his land uh, and take, you know, and, um, and uh, doing his military training every single day. He couldn't do both. And that is where the helots took over. The helots were perhaps, and I think they were, the reason for the introduction of the agoge and the radical reorganization of Spartan society that put Sparta on this different kind of footing, uh, when, whereas before they had been kind of developing along the same lines as other uh, polis, economically and artistically speaking, at least. Uh, and then all of that stopped. Uh, so let's explore this angle right now, the, the relationship between the helots and the agoge. During the archaic period, as I said, things were going along well for the Spartans, um, but unlike the other poles, the Spartans did not appear to have been solving any land hunger problems by sending out colonies. Uh, they did send out one. This was to southern Italy, a place called Tarras, um, and it was probably a penal colony, not just a regular apoikia. Um, what the Spartans did, though, to solve their land hunger problems was to take over the land of the area neighboring them. In other words, while things were going well economically and artistically, like other poles, the Spartans were facing the same land hunger problems, but instead of sending out colonies as the other poles had done, they decided to simply march into the neighboring area to their west called Messenia. Uh, 
They conquered the people and they turned the people of Messenia into slaves whom they called Halots. As I said, the word basically comes from the word for capturing. So, uh, you know, Halisco. So it, it basically means those who have been seized. Why did they go to Messenia? It's because it was close by. Uh, it was right next door to them. And of course, the other reason is because the land was very fertile. So by taking over Messenia and by turning the people into helots there, they in effect solved their land hunger problems. Instead of sending out a colony or something like that, they simply annexed Messenia. And when they did this is not exactly known, but it's in a campaign that modern historians call the First Messenian War um, that is traditionally dated to about 740 or to 720 B.C. We know next to nothing about what happened during this first Messenian War. The Spartans destroyed the Messenians' capital at Messini, but the Messenians themselves didn't give in easily. Most of the fighting took place around the stronghold of Mount Ithome in northern Messenia. Eventually, though, the Spartans conquered the Messenians, and about a century later, these Messenians, or now Helots, uh, revolted. And that forced the Spartans to intervene in Messenia again in what is called, rather unimaginatively, the Second Messenian War. This is traditionally dated to 670 or to, or to 670 to 650. And again, we know next to nothing about it. But if you remember, it was about this time that Phidon of Argos, that tyrant of Phidon, um, who, when he defeated the Spartans at the Battle of Hissii, that was in 669 or 668, about that time. So it's very likely then that the Spartan defeat at the hands of Phidon encouraged the Helots to revolt, you see. When the Spartans finally put down this revolt, they exiled the main instigators to Sicily. Um, and uh, these exiled Helots took over a city called Zancle, and they renamed it Messina. Okay, so that is actually um, uh, still, if you go to uh, Sicily to this day, that is where the plain lands. It's at the point of the kind of the northern tip of the kind of triangle of Sicily that's right near the toe of Italy. Anyway, this revolt, the Second Messenian War, was a serious one, and it took out uh, a lot of the Spartans. It took them two decades to put it down. Although the perioikoi, that is those who lived around Sparta, played a role in the Spartan economy, the helots were the real backbone of it. They had to be held in check, therefore they couldn't be allowed to regain their independence, otherwise the Spartans' entire livelihood was in danger. This is vividly shown some centuries later in 371 BC, I'm jumping well ahead now, but you'll see the point I'm trying to make. Uh, in 371 BC, the Thebans would ultimately defeat the Spartans in a battle uh, called the Battle of Leuctra, and that would bring an end to the period known as the Spartan hegemony of Greece. And in the following year, so 370, the Thebans themselves invaded the Peloponnesus and liberated the Helots in Messenia. In fact, they helped them refound Messina, uh, their old capital, the one that had been destroyed during the first Messenian War. And that liberation of the Helots knocked Sparta out entirely. Um, uh, in, uh, Sparta never again attained its superpower status. Gone was the Spartans' economic backbone, you see. And I think you can see what I'm getting at. The dependence on the Helots and the scare from their revolt, which we call the Second Messenian War, may well have led to that radical transformation of society along military lines that was the Agoge, that educational system geared towards making first-class soldiers so as to keep in check what would always be the superior numbers of Helots. We have no idea what the ratio of Helots to Spartans was, but in the Battle of Plataea in 479 BC, that is the last battle on the mainland of the Persian Wars, again I'm fast forwarding now, we are told that the Spartans sent 5,000 hoplites and each soldier took seven Helots with him. So that's a ratio of one to seven. Uh, and of course, they wouldn't have taken every hell out from Messenia uh, to this battle. So we're looking at a ratio of perhaps one to 10, maybe one to 12 um, Spartan to hell out. Um, and a conscript army would be no good against such numbers, right? You couldn't just have everybody farming like everywhere else in Greece and then once in a while being called up for military duty. You had to have a constant military readiness. Um, and so this is a really strong link between the helots and the agoge system of merciless ruthless militarism in sparta because um the spartans 
uh, had to be released from their farm from farming their chloroi, so as to focus on developing their army in such a way that they would always be better trained, have superior tactics to, and better arms and armor than the helots that outnumbered them. There would never be another helot revolt, and by making the helots farm those chloroi, the Spartans had the leisure to do this. And finally, that Kruptea, the secret police that I talked about before, this was perhaps staffed by the elite of the Agoge to spy on the Helots and basically um, uh, keep them in submission by terror, um, making sure they didn't get up to anything naughty uh, so that we don't have another revolt, you see. Uh, the Ephors were in charge of the Kruptea and members of this secret police force uh, had the right to kill any helot that they felt like, just as every year there was kind of an unofficial or even official uh, hunting season when e any Spartan could go out and kill any helot he wanted to with impunity. It was pure terrorism. The idea was to try to keep the numbers of the helots down, so there's kind of a helot culling uh, uh, quality to it, um, but more importantly, it is really the psychological terror of just having people out there. You know, you never know if a person could just come up to you and kill you. Um, so there's no question then that the Spartans recognized their need for the her for the helots economically, and at the same time they recognized the dangers that the helots posed to Sparta because of their far superior numbers. So they had to do something about it, and and I, and I think they developed the agoge because of this. If I am right about that. And of course, it's not just me. This is a lot of people would say this too. If the Agoge developed out of the Helot problem in the mid 7th century, then this gives us a date for Lycurgus, then doesn't it? Uh, if indeed he did exist and he did introduce it. Uh, but then again, as I've talked about before, the constitution that he brought back in the form of the Retra from Delphi had to predate the Agoge. Uh, so it looks as though the Agoge was ascribed to him just to give it pedigree, another um, offshoot of the Helot problem was the development of the organization, the league that was destined to become Sparta's empire, the Peloponnesian League. And actually, it is now to that that I would like to turn right now. Um, Sparta had been gradually increasing its power over the um, uh, over the rest of the Peloponnesus over the years, but it had always been held in check by Argos. Uh, that is this city-state that you see right here, kind of in the northeast of the Peloponnesus. Um, and which dominated the north. We've talked about this before. Argos became very powerful thanks to the rule of its tyrant Phaidon. But in 546 BC, the Spartans were finally able to defeat the Argives. And this was the launching point, if you like, uh, to dominate the Peloponnesus. And just to, point, to put this year and this event in a sort of comparative context, this is the time when Pisistratus defeated the nobles at the Battle of Pelini and seized power in Athens um, for the third time, for the third and last time. Anyway, after the defeat of the Argives, Sparta made an alliance with Elis, which was intent on reestablishing its authority at Olympia. Elis is the city-state over here in the west. Um, uh, and its authority had been denuded by the activities of Phaidon. And so another alliance quickly followed with uh, Tegea in Arcadia, which is uh, just kind of here in the central part of the Peloponnesus, and um, it began a trend, really, for a series of alliances with other Peloponnesian states and the formation of what modern historians call the Peloponnesian League. There's not a precise date for when the League was formed, but it was clearly up and running by the time the Spartans interfered in Athens so as to bring the Pisistratid tyranny to an end in 510 BC. The Peloponnesian League would eventually include all of the Peloponnesus except Achaea, uh, that's here in the furthest point in the north of the Peloponnesus, and Argos. The Argives never did like the Spartans, um, and that, that is evinced by the fact that they never would join the Peloponnesian League. Uh, the League also included some members outside of the Peloponnesus. Early on, for instance, it included Thebes in Boeotia, uh, up around, uh, right over here. And uh, it is plausible to connect the Helot threat to Spartan security with the formation of this League, the idea being that if the Helots revolted again and the Spartans were hard pushed, they could count on their allies for help. In turn, they could offer help to an ally uh, if uh, that ally needed it. 
In the Peloponnesian League, the Spartan allies swore an oath to support each other in times of war and to follow the lead of Sparta. And that follow the lead of Sparta is important uh, because it clearly showed you that they were sort of the superior partners in the arrangement. No tribute was exacted by the Spartans except in times of war, and the Spartans were to be in charge of all military forces. The allies had their own sunedrion or council, each state having one vote, but only Sparta could summon a meeting of the League, so Sparta dominated it, essentially, from the outset. The Peloponnesian League enhanced the power and prestige of Sparta enormously, but it also drew the Spartans into the orbit of Greek affairs in a way that uh, their society was ill-equipped to deal with. And soon, another factor would draw Sparta into the orbit of Greek affairs, and that, of course, would be the emergence of Persia on the Greek scene. Um, so what I would like to do now to round out our consideration of Sparta um, is to turn to the onset of the Persian Wars, and in the process, uh, we will turn to the cusp of the archaic and classical periods. The Persian Wars mark the coming of age of Athens as a military power. After them, the Athenians will get their own league off the ground, um, and that is not going to go down very well with the Spartans. Uh, we will see how the Spartans did this and uh, and why in future lectures. Um, but now it is to the lead up to the Persian Wars and to uh, to the ultimate leaving of the archaic period and entering into the classical period that I would like to turn. And in this final portion of our lecture tonight, I'm going to divide it, uh, this section into two parts. In the first part, I want to conclude our discussion of Sparta with some observations on Spartan society that show its inherent weaknesses. And then in the second and final part, I want to take us down to the era of the Persian Wars, which to me end the archaic period. So let us begin with Sparta. As we've seen throughout this lecture tonight, the Spartans grew up in a military society in which fighting for the state and dying for the state were placed first. Family life and participation in political activities were placed distant second. Serving the state honorably and giving your life in proper fashion to it were everything. All of these things, especially the importance the Spartans placed, or rather didn't place, on politics in the family, were abhorrent to other Greeks. In Athens, for example, Solon had passed a law that any citizen, male citizen that is, who did not take part in political life was to be punished. And Aristotle would later coin the phrase, Hoanthropos estin pol politikons doon, man is a political animal by which he really meant man is a, is a creature that lives in a polis. Um, but the idea being that man derives his essential humanity, a human being does derives his essential humanity from taking part in the life of the polis, in politics and in societal life. So it's hardly a surprise that the Spartans were admired and disliked by the other Greeks at this, uh, in equal measure simultaneously. If the Spartans had maintained a lifestyle that cut them off from the rest of the Greeks, like living in a commune, uh, they may well have led a model existence compared to, uh, to life in other polis, but they didn't. They didn't live in a commune. And as I've talked about before, the Peloponnesian League and the reputation of the Spartan army drew the Spartans into affairs well beyond the Peloponnesus. For example, in 546 BC, the king of Lydia named Croesus went to war against the king of Persia. And the details of this don't concern us here. We will talk about it later. But the bottom line is that King Croesus needed allies. This was an audacious move on his part. So he turned to who? Sparta for support. His move shows that the reputation of Sparta's army had traveled far and wide across the Aegean into Asia Minor, in fact. Asia Minor, of course, is modern-day Turkey. The Spartans didn't help Croesus. They turned him down. And we'll talk about why in a moment. Um, uh, this was the same King Croesus, though, if you remember, who had consulted the Oracle of Delphi to find out if he should invade, uh, if he should attack the Persian Empire, and um, whether he should wage war on the great king. And he had received that cryptic answer, if you cross the Halys River, uh, you will destroy a mighty kingdom. And he thought that that meant that he would destroy the Persian king, king but instead he destroyed his own kingdom. Sparta's reputation on the mainland was also paramount. As we know, in 510 BC, 
that family, the Alcmeonidae of Athens, had successfully pressured the priestess of Apollo at Delphi to urge the Spartans to liberate Athens from tyranny. This family, the Alcmeonidae, didn't get the Pythia to put pressure on Thebes, you see, or Corinth, or anywhere else, but on Sparta. Why? Because um, Sparta had this preeminent reputation for military greatness. And Sparta's social and military developments might sound great, um, and they certainly contributed to the Spartan mirage, as we've talked about before. But the social and military developments of their society that propelled them to have this big reputation would ultimately affect the city detrimentally, because they would ultimately, because of that reputation, that, that preeminent reputation, they would ultimately involve Sparta in central Greek affairs. And this was something that the Spartans never wanted to have happened. They never even expected it to happen, I think. Uh, was that naive on their part? We don't know. It's a judgment that I'll leave to you. But if you're going to be the biggest and strongest in a uh, anarchic, violent place, uh, it, perhaps it should be uh, expected that people weaker than yourselves will ask you for help. Um, but whatever the case of that may be. Um, another thing that affected the Spartans detrimentally was their reliance on their captive people, the Helots, who far outnumbered them, um, and, and, even, and they relied on them to provide their own people with sustenance. They were their sort of economic backbone. Well, with all of these sorts of qualifications, the Spartans were anything but poised to take on a role in wider Greek affairs. The refusal to help Croesus in Asia Minor is, I think, an example of this. The principal reason that they gave to Croesus was because of the, dis the, the distance involved. Uh, and at first sight, this, of course, makes sense. It's a long way from Sparta to Asia Minor. However, when the Spartans had enslaved the Messenians in that first Messenian war, and they had turned themselves, uh, and they had turned those those uh, Messenians into helots. The Spartans, at, at that moment, created an Achilles heel for themselves in their domestic security and in their foreign affairs. The helots far outnumbered them, and so the Spartans were forced to be careful not to commit large forces elsewhere in Greece and especially overseas. Because if they did that, then that would diminish the manpower reserves at home. Should the helots choose to revolt. So we see another reason for their refusal to support Croesus. It's not going to get any better either. Uh, it's only going to get worse. When, for instance, they marched to Athens in 510 BC so as to liberate uh, Athens from tyranny, and again, they marched again in 508 to support Isagoras, um, this was entirely different. Athens was not as far away as Lydia. If there were a helot revolt, then any Spartan force could return home fairly quickly. They'd be home in a matter of days. Um, and in any case, the government back home, that's back home in Sparta, could call on the members of the Peloponnesian League for assistance. Remember I said that by the time that the Spartans expelled Hippias from Athens in 510 BC, the Peloponnesian League was uh, well up and running. Besides, there was already enmity between Athens and Sparta. There was another reason for the Spartans marching in Athens because of this enmity. Uh, and who was this Croesus anyway? <laughs> Even if they helped them, what would they have gotten out of the whole matter? So th it's really a different matter why they marched on, on Athens. Now, suddenly finding yourself in a situation in which you have no experience is not necessarily the end of the world. I mean, uh, uh, look at me on YouTube. This is something totally new for me. You can adapt, you can learn. But the Spartans never really did this. Um, to make matters worse, Sparta suffered a, this declining population that impacted on its fighting strength. This was what its society was all about in the first place, right? Its fighting strength uh, was the be-all and the end-all of Spartan society. And as I mentioned before, in 479 BC, at the Battle of Plataea, that is the last battle on the mainland of the Persian Wars, um, there were about 8,000 men in the Spartan army. 5,000 of these served at that battle in the same year. But a century later, in 371, only 700 Spartans fought against Thebes at the Battle of Leuctra in Boeotia. And, and finally, towards the end of the 4th century, in 330 BC, Aristotle tells us that there were only 1,000 Spartans left, presumably Spartiates. But that's a real dwindling of the population. Um, 
Incidentally, Leuctra, the Battle of Leuctra in 371 BC was a crucially important battle because it falls in the period known as the Spartan hegemony. hegemony. Uh, this Spartan hegemony lasted from 404 BC when the Spartans defeated the, uh, the Athenians in the Peloponnesian War to 371 BC. And as this period of the Spartan hegemony wore on, Sparta's leadership proved unpopular, and the Thebans decided to take them on in battle in 371 BC, hence the Battle of Leuctra. And the Thebans won, and as a result, Sparta's ascendancy over Greece came to an end. The Spartans knew that Leuctra was a make-or-break battle. They had to win it to continue their hegemony. If they lost it, they would lose everything, just as Plataea in 479 had been a make-or-break battle. A win there for the Greeks would have spelled the end of the Persian presence in Greece. And yet, in 371 BC, Sparta could only send 700 hoplites to fight at Leuctra, compared to the 5,000 in 471, 479, 100 years earlier. Look at that difference. You see, you could really get a sense of the dwindling population of Sparta over that time. When other polis were experiencing population increases, the Spartan population decline is startling. Why, we might ask, why did this happen? Well, one explanation is the number of Spartans who died in battle. I've said this before. Remember the Spartan ethos, which was to stand firm and to die rather than to live and fight another day. Of course, the exposure of male babies who were deemed unfit would not have helped their population numbers either. And then we can build in natural deaths and natural disasters. For instance, in 464 BC, there was a massive earthquake in the Peloponnesus. Uh, it killed as many as, uh, well, it killed a great number of Spartans, triple figures, probably quadruple figures even, uh, because we know that the entire co uh, uh, core of Ephebes, the entire cadet corps, boys in the Agoge between the ages of 14 and 20, uh, were wiped out. Uh, they were all killed in this earthquake. Um, and that would have been an entire rank, if you like, that was next in line to serve full time in the army, gone. Uh, but there's also a theory that because the men were so often away on campaign or dying, and even when they were at home, they spent so much time in the Susitian that they weren't spending time with their wives all that often. Um, not as often as they should have been doing uh, if they wanted to have a lot more babies. And this means that the women, of course, were not becoming pregnant as often as they could. And so the women were having fewer babies. And so we have this demographic crisis. Um, something like what actually the world is experiencing now. I know that you probably have heard nothing but the fact that we have an overpopulation of people in the world, but the truth is, is that the birth rates around the entire world, with very few exceptions, are staggeringly low, and that um, uh, that the, uh, the world will, will experience a lot of problems in the future because of the lack of uh, people being born. Uh, in fact, there's a great book about this, if you'd like to just listen to it on Audible, it's called What to Expect When No One's Expecting. You see, it's a kind of a pun on the uh, famous pregnancy book, What to Expect When You're Expecting. This is What to Expect When No One's Expecting. Uh, and I, I re really recommend this book. It's a very, very interesting read. It totally gives you a different take on things than what the media will tell you. Anyway, whatever the case of the population decline in Sparta, and I think that everything that I've just listed for you are all probably contributing factors. There is no question that Sparta was facing problems that no other polis was facing. And there's no question that these problems detrimentally affected Sparta as time continued. The toughest and best trained army in Greece, yes, but at what cost? And it is here that I would like to finish our analysis of Sparta, at least the growth of Sparta as a polis and the growth of Sparta as head of the Peloponnesian League. We are, of course, going to be coming back to Sparta a lot in this course. But we've needed to talk about Sparta a lot, as we've been doing, to set the scene. And I hope you have formed your own views about the Spartans and their society. But, um, and, uh, but I do leave it to you to develop that in your own further research and readings. And to think about the Spartan mirage, that kind of mythos that obtains around the Spartans. Um, because uh, so much of what later thinkers have had to say about Sparta is colored by their own perceptions. Well, if the deteriorating relations between Athens and Sparta weren't bad enough and didn't forecast doom and gloom down the track enough, by the start of the 5th century BC, Greece was feeling the presence of another power that would uh, cause much grief in their world. And that, of course, is 
Persia. So it is now here in this last part of our lecture that I would like to uh, move towards uh, Persia as kind of a prelude to the Persian Wars. And as I've said before, these wars are really the backdrop to the growth in Athenian imperialism in the 5th century BC. And they also bring, for me, the Archaic period to an end and usher in the Classical period. Um, I think I've mentioned before a couple of times how the Persian Wars bring the Arche Archaic period to an end. I should perhaps point out that there is a line of thought that would not see things this way, that would actually have the Archaic period end where we are right now, and the Persian Wars stand then at the start of the Classical period. I don't accept that. I don't actually buy that line for me. I'm really more happy to think of the Persian Wars as bringing the kind of the, the being sort of the denouement of the archaic period, bringing the archaic period to an end, because there's such a big change in Greek history that comes about afterwards, the sort of changes that happened in Greece um, after the Persian Wars are really as radical and as transformational as what happened in the 8th century Renaissance. But we'll come back to that point later on. Now let's talk about Persia. The Persian Empire was enormous. It stretched from Thrace, that is modern-day modern Bulgaria, across the Hellespont, uh, that is the Dardanelles, to Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. It ran through Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan, to Pakistan. And at one point, it had Egypt and the Levantine coast included in it uh, for good measure. It was, therefore, enormous. It was also too vast for one person to control effectively. And that is why... A king of Persia named Darius, who was king from 522 BC to 486 BC, divided the empire into 20 administrative regions called in the Persian language satrapies. And each satrapy was headed by a satrap who was appointed by the great king. The great king, by the way, is the official title of the Persian king. Darius is the king that we're going to be dealing with uh, right now and, and also at the beginning of the next lecture. Um, and we will also be learning about uh, his son, Xerxes, as time goes on. But now Dar Darius. The satrap, that is the provisional governor of these different regions, had to pay an annual tax to the great king, as well as levy troops as and, uh, and when needed. But apart from that, the satrap was pretty much left to his own devices um, in his satrapy. Ultimately, though, real power lay in the hands of the great king, who ruled absolutely. The Greeks of the mainland didn't know a great deal about the Persians. They were swayed by stories of how rich the great king was and how big and invincible the Persian army was. This last point is important for us. How big and invincible was the Persian army? Well, we're going to be finding out in time. The Greeks called the Persians barbarians. And this word at this time did not actually mean uncivilized in the sense that we use it. It simply meant that the Persians did not speak Greek. To the Greeks, anyone who didn't speak Greek sounded as if he were saying bar, 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 bar. Um, and out of this bar, bar, bar sound came the Greek coinage of barbaroi or barbarians. But it didn't actually have the value judgment built into it. In fact, there were other non-Greek civilizations, such as the Egyptians, which the Greeks looked at with great admiration. But nevertheless, they still called them barbaroi. The Persian artifacts that we see in museums or on sites today and archaeological sites are certainly testimony to the high degree of Persian craftsmanship. The Greeks would have been well aware of this. Um, the Greeks knew about the Persian artistic talents. And it is important to understand that when the Greeks called any other peoples, not just the Persians barbarians, they really just meant that they were other, they were non-Greek. Well, the Persian Wars have their origins in what is called the Ionian Revolt. And this broke out in 499 BC. We go to the coast of Asia Minor for this. That is down to this area right around here the southwest coast of Asia Minor, known as the Ionian coast. Here there were a number of Ionian cities that had been part of the Persian Empire since the King Cyrus, the Persian King Cyrus, who conquered Croesus of uh, Lydia in about 546 BC. This is the same King Cyrus, by the way, that is named Koresh in the book of Isaiah, um, who let the Jews go who had been abducted and in the great Babylonian captivity and kept there for all those years. Uh, he was the one who allowed them to return to their homeland. When Cyrus conquered Croesus, he took over Lydia 
and this included the coastline of Asia Minor. These Ionian cities, these Greek settlements on the coastline of Asia Minor, paid taxes, that is tribute to the great king, and they were forced to live under the rule of, a, of Persian-backed tyrants. Um, so they weren't autonomous or anything like that. The Persian king imposed tyrants in each of these cities to keep them in check. And by 499 BC, so now we've just entered the fifth century, the Ionian cities had had enough uh, of the situation. Now it seems that Darius was increasing their tribute, their taxes, and he may even have been imposing trade restrictions on them, and enough eventually became enough. In this same year, 499, the tyrant of Miletus, a man named Aristagoras, stepped down from power. He gave up his tyranny, and he called on the Ionian cities to revolt from their tyrants and to defy the great king. This was a bold move on his part, and Aristagoras knew uh, that the Ionians themselves could not resist Darius. Um, Darius, Darius, I use the two terms, the two pronunciations interchangeably. Darius was too powerful. He could levy these huge armies if he needed to. So Aristagoras needed support, and he went to the mainland of Greece so as to solicit help. And there are no prizes for guessing who, which was the first place he went to, Sparta. But Herodotus, and we'll talk more about Herodotus in our next lecture, Herodotus, the so-called father of history, who is our main source for the Persian Wars, he tells us the story that when Aristagoras went to Sparta, he told King Cleomenes that Darius, Darius lived three months' march from the sea. Cleomenes immediately sent him packing. Again, the distance factor, you see. Distance and helots combined for the Spartans to make a uh, uh, and always the answer, no, we're not going to help anybody that will force us to be months away from our homeland because then the helots will revolt and we can't have them. In the end, only the city-state of Athens and the city of Eretria on the island of Euboea, which is this kind of long, finger-like shaped island off the coast of Athens, uh, only they, those two states sent help. <clears throat> 20 ships from the Athenians and five ships from the Eretrians. The high point in the Athenian, I'm sorry, the Ionian revolt came in the year 498 BC, the year after it started, with the burning of Darius's most westerly palace at the city of Sardis. The great king had a number of palaces throughout the Persian Empire. He and his court basically toured around the place, went from one to another, depending on the season, some in the winter, more southerly, some uh, in the north, during the, the, uh, the more um, southern in the summer times and so on. Sardis was the most westerly one. And the, well, the Greeks captured the city, the palace, and looted it, and then for good measure burned it. In the following year, in 497, the Athenians and the Eretrians returned home. Over the next few years, the Ionian cities enjoyed some successes against the Persian king, but he was not going to let this go without punishment. And in the year 494 BC, the uh, Ionian fleet was decisively defeated at the Battle of Lade, which was near Miletus. So Miletus, you can see, is right over here. It's kind of slightly inland. Um, Lade is a naval battle that took place right off on the coast. However, because of the silting effect over the centuries, as we're talking, you know, 2,500 years ago, um, Lade is the only naval battle that you can take a bus to go and visit where it actually took place. The, the land has, has extended out to the sea now uh, where the actual battle took place. But nevertheless, uh, at the Great Battle of Lade in 494, just off the coast of Miletus, the, the Ionian fleet was destroyed by the Persians. And subsequently, the Ionian revolt was therefore over. Darius then, at this point, was now uh, reestablished in control of the entire coastline of Asia Minor, and he decided he was going to punish Miletus hard, because Miletus had, of course, spearheaded the revolt. And he gave orders that all the men in Miletus were to be seized, and they were to be sent to live at the mouth of the Tigris River, uh, as, for the, uh, as, as slaves, of course. And as for the women and children, he gave orders that they were to be seized and sold as slaves anywhere uh, in the empire, sold off. And so, in effect, Miletus was depopulated. We have kind of ethnic cleansing, if you like. Um, and this punishment sent shockwaves throughout the Greek world. There's even a story that when a playwright named Phrynichus in Athens wrote a tragedy a play, a tragic play called The Capture of Miletus, 
Um, it so saddened the Athenians and it brought back so many memories for them and disturbed them so much that they actually was fined a thousand drachmas uh, by the Athenian state for reminding the Athenians of, the, of such a horrible thing. Well, as for Darius, once he had finished depopulating Miletus, he started to go crazy, basically. He got really enraged, thinking about the burning of the Sardis Palace. And he, we are even told, again, by Heraldus, who delights in these kind of colorful anecdotes, that he had a servant say, stand behind him at mealtime, and every single day, once a day at least, whisper in his ear, Sire, remember the Athenians. Okay, because after all, he, he, he knew that they were the ones that had helped the revolting Ionians. He blamed Athens and Eretria for this, and he decided on a punitive measure, a punitive mission to Greece. And in 492 BC, so just two years after the end of the Ionian revolt, he sent a fleet against the Greeks under the, his son-in-law, Mardonius. And this fleet, to go to Greece, hugged the coast of the North Aegean rather than sail directly across the Aegean to Euboea and then Attica. And we know that it hugged the coastline of the North Aegean because bad weather around the Chalcidice region, that would be this area up over here, this kind of three finger-like extensions up in northern Greece. Uh, uh, we know that, uh, that, that he hugged the coastline of this area because around the Chalcidice, a bad weather, a big storm there wreaked havoc on the fleet and the fleet was forced to go back to Persia. So the 492 attempt was aborted. Darius trained, uh, sorry, tri tried again in 490 BC, and this time he sent a fleet commanded by his nephew Artaphernes and a Persian named Datus. This time the fleet sailed straight across the Euboean, uh, uh, straight across the Aegean to Euboea, and in 490 BC we have a much more serious invasion threat: a Persian fleet sailing directly across the Aegean Sea, right from from down in the um, in the southwestern port of uh, Turkey, right across over to Athens, and there's Euboea, that big island right there. Well, um, this, uh, and then it landed. Uh, uh, first, it, it, it was going to uh, uh, sail directly across the Aegean. It was going to attack Euboea and then burn Eretria, and then it was going to go on to attack the Athenians. And this invasion force would land in 490 and would ultimately lead to the great battle of Marathon, 26 miles outside of Athens. And now we get to a big question. Did Darius intend in this invasion force of 490 merely to punish Eretria and Athens for supporting the Ionian revolt, or did he have something else, something grander in mind? This is a very important question that many, many historians have talked about. As we'll see in the next lecture, this 490 BC mission ended in a Persian defeat at the Battle of Marathon. The Athenians would ultimately defeat the Persians at Marathon. We're going to talk all about that battle. And it would be only a decade later, under not Darius, who would die in the meantime, but under his son Xerxes, the more famous Persian king, who, that uh, a, a full-out, much, much larger invasion of Greece would take place. Uh Certainly Xerxes, no question about it, was intent on conquering all of Greece out of revenge for the Persian defeated Marathon. Uh, often when we talk about the Persian Wars, we mean Xerxes' invasion. We talk about the Persian Wars as the period sort of from 480 to 479. Uh, but getting back to my original question, does this mean that the 490 campaign, the one that Darius sent, was merely a prelude to Xerxes' invasion, or should it be considered part of the Persian Wars as a whole? That is, should we therefore talk about the Persian Wars period between 490 and 479 BC, or, uh, or is it only properly speaking that latter portion of it? A lot of this, the answer to this question depends on what we can discern of Darius's aims. According to Herodotus, Darius's mission was not just to punish. Athens, uh, he did not want to just punish Athens and Eretria and leave it at that. He was, according to Herodotus again, using the burning of Sardis as a pretext to extend Persian influence over the whole of Greece. In other words, Darius intended to conquer all of Greece and absorb it into his empire. Now, this is possible. 
Persia, for some time now, had been getting involved in northern Greece. The Persian force in 492 under Mardonius, the one that was wrecked by the storm and had to return to Persia. Before that happened to it, it had conquered the northern Aegean island of Thassos, which is right, you can barely can see it on this map. Um, it's right up there, right where my cursor is pointing to. And, um, uh, and it had made some advances into Macedonia. Uh, it was logical, therefore, that as Darius expanded his empire westwards, he would indeed set his sights on the Greek mainland. It was Darius, for example, who had taken over the area of Thrace, conquered the Thracians, and made Thrace a satrapy. Okay, uh, you see how the Thracian the Thrace is actually part of the uh, part of the uh, Persian Empire. It's part of the blue here on this map. Moreover. Darius sent messengers to all of the Greek states demanding earth and water. These were tokens of submission, earth and water. And apparently a number of states actually complied. They, uh, states such as Argos and Thebes. They medies. This is what the Greek verb is in Greek. Uh, because uh, to go over to the Persian signs, the Medes were an ethnicity within the Persian Empire. So that they, to, to medies is this Greek verb, meaning to, to basically become a Quisling and go over to the Persian side of things. Um, however, um, although some states like Argos and Thebes accepted th uh, that and they Medes, they, they, they gave earth and water as tokens of submission to the messengers. These messengers were put to death in Athens and Sparta. In fact, there's a very colorful anecdote that when they went to Sparta and they demanded earth and water as tokens of submission, the Spartans merely took the ambassadors and threw them down a well with the words, you'll find plenty of earth and water down there. Um, so it's pretty clear that those two states uh, were not going to, to submit. And it's pretty clear what they thought of Darius's demands. Well, the 490 BC mission seemed set on conquering Greece then. Uh, so we could well say that Athens and Retria, um, if they had not supported the Ionian Greeks, then perhaps um, Darius would not have <clears throat> invaded Greece if all he wanted to do, um, uh, I'm sorry, no, we could say then that if Athens and Retria, even if they had not supported Ionia in their revolts, um, that Darius would still have invaded Greece because he seems to have been intent on reducing it all to his to, to submission. Um, because he went around and he sent these ambassadors everywhere. Why would he have done that if all he wanted to do was punish the Athens and Retria? So you can see why the issue is important. Who's to blame for the Persian Wars? That is to say, if Darius had already intended to subjugate Greece as part of some Western imperialistic policy, then ultimately it wouldn't have mattered whether any mainland state or not uh, had supported the Ionian revolt. We can't blame anyone then. But having said all that and laid out the case for the fact that, for the idea that um, Darius wanted to subdue all of Greece, let us step back for a moment and rethink whether the 490 BC campaign should be seen as part of the Persian Wars. Um, I think that there are grounds to argue that Darius did not intend to conquer all of Greece. For one thing, he did not himself lead the Persians against the Greeks. He stayed in Persia. The forces that he sent both in 492 and in 490 were not really substantial ones. They were enough to attack the two cities like Eretria and Athens, but not to take on all of the Greeks. Surely he would have heard, of course, of the fighting capacity of the Spartans, uh, as everyone had. And if he wanted to take over all of Greece, he must have known that at some stage he was going to have to fight the Spartans. Uh, and for that, he would certainly need more troops. Also, uh, accompanying the Persian attack force in 490 was none other than the former tyrant of Athens, Hippias. This was the same Hippias who had been expelled by a Spartan force in 510 BC. This is the Hippias who was the son of Pisistratus, the tyrant of Athens. Hippias had ended up after he had been expelled in Sigium on the Troad, that is kind of northwestern Turkey, and eventually he had ended up in one of the courts of the Persian satraps. He was very elderly at this point, probably in his 70s, if not his 80s. So his return to Greece is very interesting, I think. Darius must have wanted to install him as ruler of Athens. That's the only reason to bring this figure back into the story. But if Darius wanted to conquer all of Greece, why would he bring Hippias back and then to, uh, and then to rule only one place? It, it makes much more sense for the 490 
BC invasion, therefore to be thought of as a punitive invasion, a punitive force against Eritrea, um, uh, and then of course against Athens. Given Athens's economic and cultural reputation by this point, how sweet it would be for Darius to control it via a puppet ruler, Hippias. Now, you're probably thinking that there is a flaw in my argument. What about Darius's messages to all the Greeks demanding earth and water? If he was only moving against Eretria and Athens, why send messengers to every Greek state? It's a good argument that you throw against me, but I suspect that Darius was simply testing the waters to see how the Greeks might react. His main aim was likely to be, I think, still the punishment of Athens and Eretria. These were the two that together had helped burn the palace of Sardis, and that is what enraged him the most. But if other states happened to submit to him, given the stories of the invincibility of the Persian army, um, this might well have caused other states who didn't know any better to submit automatically to Persia. That, together with the news of the fate of Miletus, remember that had been depopulated, uh, would have could together caused states to submit to him, you know, not wanting to, uh, you know, resist the irresistible. Um, and this would have just been icing on the cake for Darius if he got anyone else to submit to him. Even thicker icing, of course, would be the surrender of the Spartans, given the Spartans' uh, reputation. And who knows? He may, he, he may not have actually been that uh, unreasonable to think that they would have submitted. Given the Spartans' reluctance to commit forces elsewhere, uh, you know, the story of why Cleomenes rejected Aristagoras would have been well known. This would have circulated widely by now. And given the Spartans' enmity with the Athenians, also well known, Darius wouldn't have um, been that um, unreasonable to have expected them um, to not support the Athenians when he marched on Athens. Events uh, will actually prove him right in that regard, although kind of uh, in, in a mysterious sort of way, we'll talk about why that might have happened. The, the Spartans did not ultimately fight against Darius at the Battle of Marathon. We'll talk about why though next time. But deep down, Darius probably knew that the Spartans would never submit to him. But what harm would there be in trying? After all, um, as the modern expression goes, you have to be in it to win it. And so it is, in conclusion, that in the year 490 BC, Darius launched his fleet against the Greeks. However, the Persians were in for a nasty shock when they landed on mainland Greek soil at Marathon. The stories of the might and invincibility of the Persian army would prove to be just that, stories. And these stories would end abruptly on the battlefield of Marathon, thanks to the genius of the Athenian strategos, or General Miltiades, uh, and we will deal with that and we'll learn all about that battle in our next lecture. Thank you.